Hello everyone. Paul and I are out once again on a cold and frosty morning and we've come to our favourite spot, the Roman townhouse here in Dorchester to bring you the third instalment of January with Joseph. Though you could get us under the Trades Descriptions Act because this time it's only a little bit about Joseph. He turns up at the end but what we're going to be doing is looking a touch at the life of Joseph's dad, Jacob. So where we left off last week, Joseph had come to a wonderful realisation. The realisation that was encapsulated in his name. God speaks and he lives. Zaphonath Pania. We're in God's hands. He wants what's best for us. He wants to speak life to each and every one of us. And he does so so often the things we do and say the way we act they get in the way a little bit not for dear joseph as life was spoken to him as he was released from prison we heard how he embraced it all jacob took a very different path joseph's dad lived what could be described as a colorful existence and there are lots of things in his story that we could point at and say wow he got that wrong but remember, all of it is there so that we can understand a great truth. A truth which I believe with all my heart, Jacob himself came to understand in this piece of scripture we're looking at today. God speaks and he lives. Let's dig a bit deeper. I want to start today with two contrasting stories. The first one is about a man who lived some 2,600 years ago. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, though he is most commonly known as the Buddha, a name which means the enlightened one. Many adherents of Buddhism will describe their religion as being common sense. They say, well, this is all common sense, things that we have worked out, that the Buddha has taught us, that make living life much easier and much better. So a story is told of Siddhartha Gautama that one day a woman came to see him and she brought terrible news. She said, my son has died. Can you bring him back to life? And Siddhartha said to her, yes, I can. First of all, though, I will need you to find mustard seeds from a house where no one has died. So this woman grabbed a jar and she traveled all around the country looking for a house where no one had died so she could get these mustard seeds to bring to the Buddha. And every single house she went to, she discovered the same thing. Someone had died there. And then she came back to the Buddha, to Siddhartha Gautama, and she said, you've taught me a valuable lesson. Death is part of life. Now I can accept the death of my son and I can move on. And that's where the story ends. Now I want to contrast that with a famous passage of scripture and it's found in Luke chapter 7. Let's look at that. We'll start to read at verse 11. Soon afterwards Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. What a story. What an account. God speaks and we live. Do you see that contrast? What a difference there is. Buddhism offers us common sense. Death is a part of life, we just have to come to terms with it. What our Lord Jesus offers is supernatural and entirely different. He reassures us that when God speaks, we live, not just for a short time on earth, 
but for eternity. What a message, what a thing for us to learn. Let's journey now with Jacob as he learns all about that. God tells us in his precious word that his ways are far above our ways and that his thinking is far above our thinking and our thoughts. God is cleverer than we are. God knows what he's doing. And the wonderful news is that he profoundly loves us. But so often human beings believe firmly they know better. Our common sense, as it has been called, isn't that sensible at all. In fact, it often runs against what God calls us to do because we simply can't grasp the vastness and the beauty and the loveliness of God's plan. I call it, and have called it in the past, etch-a-sketch mentality. What seems like common sense suddenly works out to be not common sense. Let me tell you what I mean. You're probably scratching your head and thinking, etch-a-sketch mentality, what's that? It's about an incident that happened when I was a little boy. I went to see my cousins, Karen and Julie, at Christmas time, and they had been given an etch-a-sketch. And when I saw this thing, I don't know if you remember this, if you're younger than 50, you probably don't. They had uh, two little dials that you turned, and it, it drew straight lines. You couldn't draw anything, because it, it was just... I don't know, the more I think about it, the more I think they were a bit lame. Sorry if you're the producer of Etch-a-Sketch. But when I saw this as a kid, it was the best thing I'd ever seen. And I kept playing with it and my cousins wanted it back and I didn't want to give it to them. I looked at my mum and dad and I said, please, please, can I have an Etch-a-Sketch? And I said, if, if I can have an Etch-a-Sketch, I will never want anything else in my whole life and that's what I said to them and as a little kid that's what I firmly believed I thought nothing in this world could be as wonderful as an etch-a-sketch that's all I want forever and ever how foolish of course I was can you imagine how I would have looked when the iPhone 12 was released and there I was with my etch-a-sketch not able to join in with the fun and all of these other different things but that's the mentality we often bring to God. We say to God, oh, I'm convinced because of my common sense, this is what I want, this is what I need. You should let me have this, and if I can have this, I don't want anything else. That's enough, it's sufficient for me. But God has more for us. He has life itself. God speaks and we live. Jacob, Jacob the poor chap, time and again, demonstrated this etch-a-sketch mentality. If I can just have this, it will all be okay. How wrong he was. Let's look at some examples. So first off, Jacob decides he wants a birthright. Now let's bear in mind right at the start, God promises him a wonderful birthright and promises him countless blessings and that he will be the father of a dynasty from which wonderful things will emanate forth. We of course know that even Jesus came from Jacob's line and lineage. However, Jacob and his mum quickly draw the conclusion that God isn't doing what he said he was going to do and they decide to take matters into their own hands. I'm sure they thought it was common sense. And once again, of course, it shows this mentality of, I know best. If I can just have this, everything will be okay. They ignore God and Jacob lies and cheats, offends his brother almost irreparably, steals a birthright from his father, having dressed up as his brother and just does all kinds of terrible things. To sum it up, he tears his family apart, courtesy of his common sense and courtesy of an attitude that says, I know best and this is what I want and this will get everything sorted. He ignores God with disastrous consequences. He forgets the fact that it is our wonderful God who speaks and we live. And he doesn't just leave it there. Jacob journeys on 
and he has fled his family home. He goes to live with his uncle Laban and he meets the love of his life, Rachel. And he works for seven years so that Rachel can be his wife. And he says, she's lovely, she's marvellous, she's all I want. If I can just have Rachel, everything will be wonderful. But of course, we know all these years on that God had a very different plan. God's plan was for Jacob to become the father of a great nation. He was in fact going to have a very big family. He was going to have 12 children and he was going to have effectively four wives. But as things went on, Jacob himself was tricked. He married Leah and she was his first wife. He had lots of children with her and because he was so convinced Rachel is the girl for me and everything else is pretty meaningless. He treated Leah awfully. If you read the biblical account, it's just heartbreaking. Over and over again, Leah provides Jacob with a child and she says in this painful way each time, maybe now my husband will love me and he doesn't. It's awful. Eventually she gives up and just says, well, praise the Lord. I have some lovely children and isn't that a marvellous blessing? And she's content with that. Jacob hurts about three quarters of his family because he's convinced he only needed one bit of it. Again, he misses the point. Jacob is sure that his common sense is right. And he forgets God speaks and we live. He is wrestling with God and pretty soon he's really wrestling with God. Jacob finally goes back to his homeland. He's reunited with Esau but on the way he meets with God. It's a famous moment. He meets with God and he wrestles with God and God famously touches his hip and it is wrenched out of its socket. And Jacob's name is changed from Jacob to Israel. But that wrestling with God is significant because it's something Jacob has done all of his life. He, when he was journeying to see his uncle Laban, had an encounter with God and he worshipped God. And he saw the famous Jacob's ladder, the angels ascending and descending. He worshipped his Lord and his God. But then very nearby, on the way back, he's wrestling with God. And don't we all find ourselves in that situation from time to time? Sometimes worshipping God and saying, God is wonderful. Lord, I just want to do what you want. I want to be after your heart. And then we find ourselves wrestling with God, saying, wait a minute, my common sense is saying something different. I'm not going to do this. And we wrestle with God. We all often find ourselves between those two tensions. Well, Jacob did this par excellence. He shows all of us what can happen. And that wrestling carries on. It doesn't just stop by the river, but it continues as his family life develops. And he is looking after his 12 sons and those who remain of his wives. So Jacob continues to live his life and to do his thing. And I'm sure that he continued to live in that tension between worshipping God and wrestling with him. But then tragedy struck. Jacob was brought the news that his favourite son, Joseph, was dead. The beautiful robe that he had given him to honour him was returned, covered in blood. Of course, we have read the story know that that was animal's blood and we know that Joseph was off and enslaved in Egypt. Jacob didn't know that and he mourned and mourned and mourned. All in his life that was precious seemed to be gone, with the exception of his very youngest son, Benjamin. But death was kind of the chorus that was going around Jacob's mind at this time. And the Bible is very rich and graphic in its description of his heartbrokenness and his prolonged and protracted period of mourning. However, we know that God speaks and we live. And this is the moment, and we come to it in our reading today, when Jacob discovers this great truth. Because 
God has spoken and Joseph has lived. And now God has spoken and Jacob is going to live. Jacob, now an old man, journeys all the way over to Egypt and the son he thought was dead is there to greet him. I love it in that moment when in the original Hebrew it says that Joseph fell upon his father's neck. He gets his arms right round him and hugs him and cuddles him and kisses him and there is joy that is just immeasurable. And what does Jacob say? He says, now let me die. That's a funny thing to say. It's not something perhaps you or I would say in those circumstances. I don't believe Jacob really wanted to die at that moment. I don't think he wanted a lightning bolt to come down and zap him. Now let me die, which is what Jacob actually said in the original Hebrew, probably means something as simple as this. Now I get it. Now I understand. Now it all makes sense. Lord, I have tried to do it in my own strength, my own understanding, over and over and over again. I've wrestled with you, but now I get it. You speak, we live. And now Jacob, in his old age, in his frail dotage, is given life in a new and wonderful way that he didn't expect. We can learn so much from this. This is a beautiful story. It's a beautiful historical account, but it's also something that we can use to understand more about our beautiful faith. God speaks to us in and through Jesus Christ. And when we hear his word of life, and when we accept him into our heart as our Lord and Saviour, everything changes. For you and I today, I emphasize this above all things. God speaks and when we hear his voice and reach out to him through his son Jesus, we live. I pray that the Lord will bless you most richly over this next week. God bless.